Well, this is the revolving bookcase we're going to build in this issue. As you can see, it's made primarily out of cherry. Of course, any species of wood will work. I went with cherry for the look that it provides me. The field panels are solid wood. The styles and rails are also solid wood. The back panel and the shelves are made out of birch plywood, the home center variety. They're edge banded with another hardwood species and then stained black. And that black really offsets the cherry wood side panels. Now, as you can see, it rotates. Now, the purpose for this ro rotating bookcase is so that you have a little bit of flexibility within your home as to where you can place it. Now, most bookcases have to go against the wall and they have to be attached to the wall to prevent them from tipping over. This bookcase can go anywhere in the room. It could go against the wall if you provide enough clearance for it behind so that it can rotate or it can be in the middle of the room as if it were a column supporting the ceiling. Now the top does rotate and that allows us to put a key, a simple square block attached to the ceiling joists that would drop down inside a recess on the top of this box and that will keep this bookcase from tipping over. Construction of the bookcase is very straightforward. Almost everything is a simple tongue and groove joint, some of which we'll do at the table saw, others which we'll do with a handheld router. But to get started on this project, we're going to get going with the field panels and we'll be over at the bandsaw where we're going to resaw some stock to make up these field panels. To get started on this project, I'm going to start by resawing some stock into quarter inch thick panels. Those will be our field panels. Now, of course, you can go out and purchase a quarter inch or a little bit thicker material and then plane it down to a quarter inch thick, uh, but that can be rather expensive. So, resawing your three quarter inch stock into your quarter inch uh, material, that can save you a lot of money. Now, resawing on a bandsaw is a very easy operation, and because of the width of these field panels, you can do it on your regular 14 inch bandsaw without the riser block. Now, we'll walk you through this setup a little bit, and then we'll get to resawing. To resaw on a conventional bandsaw, there's a couple of things that you need to pay attention to. One, make sure that your table is square to the blade. Two, take your stock and joint one edge, preferably the bottom edge, so that when it's sitting on the table, it's sitting square to your blade. The next thing you'll do is draw a centerline mark. In this case, I'm just resawing to the centerline, so I drew a centerline mark all along the length on the edge of the board. And that's what I want to do is cut along that line, right exactly on the center of it. But to help guide the, the workpiece and to keep it parallel to the blade, I've installed a block here. And it's just a round nose block that's lined up with my blade. And this allows me to take my stock, feed it in, cut along my layout line, and if I need to, I can steer the board in this fashion to stay on that cut line. Now, for a blade, uh, there's been much different types of blades that you should use for resawing. Um, right now, I've got a, a six tooth per inch, half inch blade in here, and it's uh, been behaving very well for me. It's nothing special. It's a Delta brand uh, bandsaw blade, and it's been serving me very well. So that's the one I'm going to use. Now, of course, uh, there are blades specifically designed for resawing that are wider and have fewer teeth per inch, and they tend to perform a little bit better in some applications. There are even carbide-tipped bandsaw blades that you can use, and those, of course, work very well. But it's just a matter of slowly feeding through. Don't overfeed it, and try to steer the board along on your cut line. Now with the resawing out of the way, we can plane all of our material to the proper thickness. This includes not only our quarter inch field panels, but the rest of the stock that we need for this project. Moving on to the styles and rails, we can start ripping and cross cutting all this material to its overall dimensions. Cutting off the styles to length, you can do one by one. There's only six of those. But each of the rails and each of the field panels all need to be cut off to exactly the same length. A stop block assures accuracy and consistency. Now I would like to point out that on a chop saw like this, or a compound miter saw, whenever you're using a stop, you should always control the, the work piece that's against the stop. If you try to start lifting the blade up before the cut is finished, this work piece could bind between the stop and the blade, and that can create all sorts of problems. 
Now at this point I've got all my stock milled up to its overall dimensions, the field panels, the styles, and the rails. Now one thing I'd like to point out, and this is just one of those little decorative touches that can really make or break a finished piece. Now you'll notice that I've got a series of numbers on each of the edges of my field panels. I was very careful when I resawed them that when I opened them up, I marked the ends so I know which piece was which. Then as I ripped them and cut them up into the smaller pieces, I kept them ordered. So that way when I get the panels all installed in the actual bookcase in the end, hopefully if I don't goof up when I install them, I'll have nice book matched field panels on each side of the bookcase. So that's one little trick. It does take a lot of uh, thinking through the process to make sure you get them numbered right and keep them in sequence, but in the end it will really make a piece look much more pleasing. So now we can turn our attention to the joinery, and that's really quite simple on this project. We're going to cut a series of grooves in the styles, as well as the rails, and then put a tongue on the end of each rail that will fit in the groove that we put on the styles. The field panels will also fit in those grooves. Now setting up to cut those grooves, we know that we need to accommodate our field panels as well as the tongues on the rails. Now the rails themselves will be machining the tongue later on, but the thickness of our field panels is already established. Now I've finished plane them and there will be a little bit of sanding, but they're really not going to get uh, any thinner than what they already are. So I'm going to take my dial caliper and measure it, and I'm at 255 thousandths. 250 thousandths of an inch would be a quarter of an inch. So I'm a little bit thick. So if I just use my quarter inch stack dado head cutter on my table saw to cut these grooves, my field panels probably won't fit real well. So what I'm going to do is add a shim between each of my stack dado head cutters, and that will expand them slightly to cut the groove to the appropriate width. With the test cut out of the way, we've got our groove at about 260 thousandths. It's about five thousandths larger than the thickness of our panel. So we'll see how it fits. Seems to fit in there nice. It's not being forced in. It holds itself in. We're in good shape. We're ready to start cutting all of the grooves on our styles. Just a few things to wrap up our setup here. I've got my quarter inch stack dado head cutter raised up three eighths of an inch. My rip fence set at a quarter of an inch. I also installed a feather board because as I'm feeding these long styles through, I want to make sure that I'm keeping my stock tight against the fence during this operation. For the center styles, you'll have to pass it over along one edge, flip it over, keeping the same face against the fence, and pass it over a second time. Moving on to the rails, we need to readjust our stack dado head cutter height but we can leave the fence at exactly the same position. On the middle rails, we'll need to pass it over once on each edge, keeping the same face against the fence, and then the top and bottom rails, we only need to cut a groove on one edge. And that is about perfect. Enough friction there to hold it in place, I don't have to hammer it in, and I don't feel or see the wood pulling apart to accommodate the tenon. So now we've got a good fit there, let's go through the setup and we'll explain that. Now as you just saw, we need to machine that tongue on the end of our rails. To do that, I've installed my half inch stack dado head cutter. I've raised it up approximately a quarter of an inch, adjusting the height until I got the width of my tongue just right. Then I've checked to make sure that my mater gauge is in fact square, passed it over with a sacrificial board. That created this cutout. Then I just set a stop block here so that we can bump our stop up against the stop, pass it over, flip it, pass it over, and then we've got our tongue machine. And one last thing to check, make sure that your rail is in fact machine so that it's square to your style. Use a good precision square to check that. As you can see, I'm getting ready now to do my assembly. There's lots of parts on this project, so you'll want to use a nice slow setting glue. I'm using liquid hide glue. I'm going to take my time, work through each of the components, starting at one end, going all the way across, come up, put my center style in, work from one end again, back to the other, put the other outside style on, clamp it up, and then we can move on. Now I'll just put glue in the 
groove where the tenon goes, or the tongue, and then the field panel goes in, but there's no glue on these field panels. They have to float because they're natural wood. Now I should also mention that I've gone through and sanded up all the surfaces that I won't be able to get to after assembly. So that means all the field panels and these inside surfaces where the grooves are. And now I've moved it over into my front bench vise to help hold it on edge while we bring in the rest of the components. Now by placing the center style in front of my part of the assembly I've already got done, I know where to place my glue in the groove at each tongue location. Again, make sure that the field panels float. They're natural wood and they are going to expand and contract. Not very much, but we do have to allow for that. And now we can start clamping it together with as many clamps as we've got. Well, that should do the trick. Moving on to the internal plywood components, I got started by using a circular saw to break down my larger panels into smaller, more manageable pieces. Then I ripped and cross-cut them to size over at the table saw. Now at this point, our shelf panels have the plywood edge exposed. And of course, we really don't want that to show on the finished piece. Now keep in mind, I'm using birch plywood for my shelves. This will be stained black, so the, the grain of it really isn't that critical because it's not going to be very noticeable. Now you can either have your grain running front to back, as it would be in the shelf, or you could have the grain running crossways. It's strictly up to you how you want the grain to look. Again, keeping in mind, it's going to be stained black, so it's not going to be that noticeable. However, we do have to address this front edge. Now, you could really use any type of hardwood as an edge banding there. You could use uh, birch, which would uh, stain up and match the plywood portion a little bit better. Uh, maple's another good choice. I've got some strips of the cherry left over from when I ripped the wider boards, and you always end up with that three-quarter inch wide piece there. Well, I'm going to turn that into edge banding. So we'll go over to the table saw, rip up those strips, and we'll get our edge banding on. Now from these long cutoff strips that I've gotten from my cherry boards, I've cut them off to about 17 inches long. And what I'm going to do is just rip them at a quarter inch wide. Now if your saw blade and table saw doesn't give you a real nice finish, what you may want to do is rip a piece, joint the stock, and rip another piece, joint the edge, rip another piece, and then that way you've always got one good face to work with. Now this blade's been uh, working very well for me, and I've been getting a real nice finish, so I'm just going straight for the cut. As we mentioned in past issues, there's a number of different ways and techniques to attach edge banding. Now in this example here, what we're going to do is get our glue spread on there nice, nice thin coat, Bring the edge banding in place, line it up very carefully for the overall length, and so it's flush top to bottom. And if you're using three-quarter inch hardwood like I am, it's probably wider than your plywood is thick, so it may overhang. We'll sand that up flush later. Now if we were to just try and clamp this, odds are really good it's going to slide on us. So I like to use tape to help hold it 
in place. And that tape will keep it from sliding back and forth as we apply clamping pressure. And then we can clamp the two shelves together with the edge banding against each other. You only need a couple clamps because all that clamping force is backed up by the wide shelf panels. In order to make this a nice strong structure and create this I-beam type shape, what we need to do is interlock all of these pieces together and not just simply rely on glue. So what we're going to do is create a series of grooves and dados. The groove will hold that back panel and then the dados will hold the shelves. And once it's all glued together and clamped together, it'll become a very strong structure. Now I'll get started by cutting my groove down this center style, quarter inch deep, three quarter inches wide, and centrally located left to right. Now I'll be doing this operation at the table saw, and I've got my three quarter inch stacked dado head cutter already all set up, so it's just a matter of taking the cut. What I'm doing now is finishing up the layout for where we need each of these dados to go. And as you can tell, we've got an awful lot of dados and then, of course, rabbits at the tops and bottoms. Now, because this panel is so long, if we try to do it on the table saw in a cross-cut application with the stacked dado head cutter, it's going to be very difficult to keep that panel square as we feed it over the cutter. So realistically, what we want to do now is take the tool to the work. And in that case, we would use a handheld router. Now, because we've got so many of these dados to cut, I'm going to make up a little jig, and it's a very simple jig. So take a look. To make the jig, I started out with a piece of quarter-inch plywood. The length is arbitrary. I've got mine about 22 inches long. Now, the width of that plywood has to be greater than the distance from the edge of your router bit to the edge of your router base. I then took and ripped a piece of oak that I'm going to use for my router fence. I ripped that to about an inch and a quarter wide, it's three quarter inches thick, cut it off to the same length. I uh, glued it onto the plywood, tacked it in place with some brads, and then after the glue had a chance to set up, I ran it over the table saw so that this outside edge is nice and straight. Now the most critical element of this for our jig fence, which helps to align our jig to the work that we're doing, we have to, of course, attach it down here so that we can hook it over the edge of the work and have this fence be square so that it has good function. And really about the best way to do that is to use a good old-fashioned precision square. If you don't have one of these in your shop, chances are good you're not making things very square. So what I'll do is I'll apply some glue onto my jig fence. I'll bring my square up, bring the jig itself into alignment with the square, clamp it, and then tack it in place with some brads. Now the jig fence itself is just three quarter inch thick birch plywood, ripped an inch and a half wide, and it's about 12 inches long. And like I say, we'll take our time, get this lined up perfectly, and then we'll tack everything together with some brads until the glue takes hold. Now what we need to do is trim up the platform to the width, which would be equal to the distance from the edge of the router base to the edge of the router bit. Now of course you do want to use the router bit that you're going to be cutting your dados with. Now I was very careful when I put my brads in here that I didn't put them in the area where I'm going to be cutting as I trim this up. Now I did add one more feature to the jig, and it's this extra cleat back here. And what that allows me to do with that, if I were to just take and feed off the end without any support here, I'm going to get some chip out on the outside edges where we really don't want to see it. So by just tacking this in, it's actually just uh, tacked in with some brads. I didn't want to glue it because if there's any variation in width, I can overcome those brads a little bit with the clamping force but it's just a matter of indexing it along, lining it up with your layout marks, and taking the cut. Well, as you can see, I've gone through a dry assembly of our bookcase at this stage. Now, because these interior components, the birch plywood pieces, are going to be stained black, this is one of those projects where we're actually going to finish it before we do the assembly. But right now, we've got to go through and make sure all of our 
shelf fronts line up flush with the front edge of the two side panels. For the stain, I'm using a water-based stain. This allows me to brush it on and work it in, go nice and slow. Now I can apply this in one of two ways. I can brush it on and then even it out with a second application, leaving it very black like I'm applying it right now. And that would almost give it a painted look. Or I can let this soak in for about 10 minutes or so and then wipe off the excess, allowing some of the grain to show through. I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet. I'm going to try it both ways on these two pieces and make a decision at that point. Well, I think I'm going to go for wiping off the excess because I can control the opacity a little bit better and I can still let a little bit of the original color shine through. I got started on the base and top of the bookcase by ripping and cross-cutting my plywood panels to their proper size. Then I started ripping all of the material for the sides of the base and top. Now we're ready to start cutting our miter joints and because of the six and a quarter height or width of the wood, it's going to be difficult to do at the miter saw, especially if you have a 10 incher. So we're going to do it at the table saw and it's going to start out with a very precise setup. What I want to do first of course, I've got the table saw unplugged. I want to make sure that my miter gauge is in fact square to the blade. So I'm using my precision square and I'll rotate it until everything's lined up just perfect. Now rather than trust the scale on the table saw, I'm using a drafting triangle to set my blade over at a 45 degree angle. And I want to make sure that it's as close as I can possibly make it. And the last part of the setup is to attach an auxiliary wooden fence. I like to extend my fence beyond the blade like so. And you'll see I've passed it over and created a curve cut. It gives me a couple of advantages. One, I know where my cut's going to be. And on this portion, the cutoff piece that will actually be somewhat underneath the blade can be pushed through with the miter gauge. And that creates it a little more safe of a cutting operation. Now with one end mitered, I've installed a stop lock on my miter gauge and of course I'm using this kerf cut over here with my layout mark to set the length and that way I can be assured that all eight of my side panels are all exactly the same length. We're going to need a rabbit along the inside faces of our side pieces. Now of course there's a number of different ways to machine a rabbit. You could use a handheld router with a rabbiting bit, a router table with a straight router bit, a dado cutter and the table saw. There's just a wide variety of ways to do it. I'll be doing it in two cuts on my table saw. I've currently got my rip fence set at a half inch and my blade raised up three quarters of an inch. And I'll pass the board through on edge. Now of course that rabbit has to be on this inside face. Now with my rip fence adjusted to three and a half inches for my base pieces and my saw blade raised up at a quarter inch, I can finish up the cut. Now notice that the waste will be on the outside edge of the saw blade rather than trapped between the saw blade and the fence. So that means I'll have to make an adjustment to my fence position when I transition from the base side pieces to the top side pieces. To reinforce the miter joint, what I'm going to use is a number 10 biscuit. And what I'll do is just bring the two mating components together, draw a reference mark, and then so I get everything back together again in the same order, I'll label each of the corners. Now I like to use number 10 biscuits on my miter joints because if you go to a 20 and you don't get your slot positioned close towards the inside edge, you can cut through with your biscuit joiner. So I use number 10s and try to position my slot as far up on that miter joint as I can get it. The bookcase needs to be adjustable in height. So we've got these little feet that we picked up at the Woodcraft store. And of course the part number for these are on the project plan. Now, I just placed it in here. I've brought the screw all the way up so the foot is as far up as it'll go. That puts the bracket down. I'll transfer my hole locations onto the sides. And I'll be mounting it, this bracket, to the sides with 5 8 inch number 8 sheet metal screws. And of course, I'll pre-drill the holes before I do that. Now, to help also carry that load or transfer the load from the foot onto the side panels, I don't want to just rely on the screws. So these cutoff pieces where we made the miter cuts, I cut them into shorter lengths 
and I'll put that on top of the bracket and glue it to the sides, sort of as a glue block as well as a stop to help support that bracket. Before we can do final assembly, what we want to do is make sure that we have access to the adjusting screws to adjust the height. Now this particular foot can be adjusted from the bottom with a wrench or from the top with a screwdriver. Now on the plans we give you the approximate location of where these holes need to be drilled. But because these are stampings and so forth and because screwdrivers are of different sizes you may want to measure them and make these hole locations match what you physically have here rather than just follow our, our dimensions on the drawings. Same thing for the diameter of the hole. We're recommending a half inch diameter hole, but if your screwdriver is bigger and it won't go through the hole, drill a bigger hole. And now you know how we're going to adjust the height during installation. Now I've taken that Lazy Susan bearing against my top shelf of the bookcase, flipped upside down, centered it up very carefully, and I'll transfer my hole locations onto there. Now the hard one, of course, is the big hole. Now using a scratch hole, I'll get some starter dimples in each of the hole locations where we'll have our mounting screws. Now we can drill our pilot holes using a 764 inch drill bit. Now we will be mounting this with 3 quarter inch by number 8 sheet metal screws. Now at that point where we need to bore that large access hole, I'm going to use a 1 16th inch drill bit, drill through, and then from the other side, I'll drill my access hole with a, a Forstner bit. Now if I drill with a Forstner bit from the other side, I'm going to probably get tear out here and I don't want to see that. And I've lined up my large hole, and we can attach the bearing with our sheet metal screws. Now after you transfer all of your hole locations, if you take a, a permanent marker and mark one hole and one spot on your Lazy Susan bearing, you can take it off and get it back on and lined up reasonably quick. Keep in mind that you're going to have a large bookcase hanging off of this and it's still going to be a challenge. So every little trick you can do at this point will ease the installation. Then when it comes time to actually mount the bookcase to the top, we can realign our index mark that we placed on there with that magic marker and then through this access hole tighten up each of the screws. Of course we'll have to rotate it around to gain access to each of those locations. And now we can assemble the base and the top boxes. It's just going to require glue, biscuits, and clamps. And as you can see just work your way around in a circle. Then glue in your four corner blocks. Once you get the glue on the glue block, slide them up and down a little bit until the glue starts to take hold. It only takes a couple of times and they'll start getting sticky real fast. And then using a band clamp we can clamp it all together. Make sure that your ends are all flush where they should be. Set it aside to dry. Now here you can see the base and the top already assembled. Now here are our four feet, and as you can imagine, when we go to install this, the feet and of course the weight of the bookcase will keep it in place. But because it is so tall and narrow, we do need some support at the top. Now over here is the top, and this is the surface that will be against the ceiling. So what we want to do is make a square opening in here, and that will hold a key. So it's sort of a keyway. To cut that little opening, I've glued together some scraps of 3 quarter inch birch plywood. And what I'm going to do is center this up on our top. Then I'll tack it in place with some brads. And now with this very simple frame, I can route out a pocket that will hold a key. Now you want that key to be at maximum a half inch thick. So I'll be using half inch plywood. So I know my pocket needs to be a half inch deep. To machine the pocket, I've installed a half inch white side router bit along with a collar. Now to set my depth, I'll just place the router on the jig, bring it down until it contacts my surface. Then I'll bring my stop rod down on top of a half inch drill bit and lock my stop rod. Now when I plunge it down, I'll have exactly a half inch depth. 
Now to make the key, just take some half inch birch plywood, rip it and cut it to length, round over the corners to match the corner radius of your router bit. Then that should fit in there nice and flush like that, allowing the top to fit up tight against the ceiling. Now this key needs to be attached to the ceiling. Be sure to use screws long enough so that they penetrate not only through this plywood, but the drywall and then into the, the joist on the ceiling. Well, this is one of those projects where you just can't decide whether to finish it before assembly or finish it after assembly. If I finish it before assembly, I'm going to have to tape off all of my dado and grooves, as well as the edges of all the shelves and so forth. Finish everything, get the tape off, and then assemble it. I'm not sure if that's going to work out real well. The next alternative, of course, is to assemble it conventionally and then finish it afterwards. But because we're going to have all these little cubby holes where the books will go on the bookshelf, it could be a problem for finishing. So you're going to have to decide at this point, depending on the type of finishing that you're going to do, whether to finish it first or after assembly. I plan to spray this one, so right now I'm thinking I'm going to assemble it first. And we'll hope that the spraying works out fine. Now I've got everything fit up real good. Now what I'll do is I'll be working with some slow set glue. I'm going to be using liquid hide glue. I don't want to have to rush through this assembly. But we'll start from the center working out. Now I'll get some glue in the two center shelf dados. You don't want to be sloppy on this assembly. Cleaning up glue after this is going to be problematic. And we'll be bringing in the back panel so I'll get glue in that area. Now I'll get two shelves in here staggered apart, one on each side. Now we can bring in the back panel. Now you'll notice that I'm not gluing the shelf to the back panel. These two shelves just keep that back panel from falling over. Now we can start bringing in two more shelves. And as you can see, I'm getting glue in the dados and grooves for the other side panel. And then we can put that in place. Now working from the center ones out, I'll get the rest of the shelves installed. And now we can glue in the top and bottom. Well, I think that's enough clamps for now. We'll let this sit for about four or five hours, and then we can do some detail sanding and move on to finishing. To finish this project, I needed to accomplish a couple of tasks. I, of course, needed to apply the finish to protect the wood. But as you may have noticed throughout the construction, some of the components on the cherry boards had both sapwood and heartwood. So to help uh, blend these two portions of the tree or the wood together, the sap and the heartwood, I added a little bit of tint to the top coats. Now for the first few top coats, I thinned down the hybrid spray-on water-based varnish with distilled water, and I also added a few drops of a golden brown trans-tint dye to it. Then I sprayed that onto the project, being very careful to apply even light coats. After I got the first few coats on, I then sanded out the entire project using 320 grit sandpaper backed up by a thick felt block. I followed that by applying two more coats of just the clear hybrid spray-on varnish, and as you can see, the results are quite stunning. That spray-on finish really blended in the colors nicely and it uh, reduced some of the effects of where we had the sap wood. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this on, on the camera or not, but the sap wood on the, the top portion was quite severe and it blended them together very nicely. And the finish has got a nice texture to it, a nice sheen. I didn't want a real high gloss on this project. So all around, I'm very, very pleased with the results I got from that spray on varnish. And this pretty well wraps up this project. Now, as you can see, I've got the bookcase on its base, and it has been on its base since construction. Now, when I go to install this in the home, what I'll end up doing is taking the top off, bring it into the room, then I'll find my location, mount that key to the ceiling, preferably directly into the, the ceiling joists. Then I'll stand the bookcase upright, mount the top onto the bookcase, using the screws through these access holes, slide the bookcase directly underneath that key, and then 
Down at the base, I'll start jacking up those screws to bring this top box into contact or to encapsulate that key that's against the ceiling. Once I get it raised up, then the next task uh, is really up to you. You'll notice that in the design, we left the top and the base just plain. And that was done intentionally because you'll probably want to trim it out with uh, moldings that are similar to what's used in your home right now. So try to follow something along those lines, maybe a crown molding at the top and a very simple shoe molding or whatever fits your room style or other pieces of furniture in that room. Uh, but other than that, the purpose of that key at the top is to keep this thing from tipping over. It can be placed anywhere in the room. It doesn't, of course, have to be against a wall or in a corner. It could be literally in the center of a room somewhere. But because it is very tall and very narrow, it is not very stable. But by adding that key on the ceiling, that'll firm things up nicely. So that wraps up this project of our revolving bookcase. I hope you've enjoyed it, and it's been a fun, challenging project. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Dayhut for Woodworking at Home.